God damn. Okay, he's kind of cooking, dude. I mean, he spent 10 minutes on this when there's like way worse shit in that article, but still, he kind of cooked on this big time. I'm saying it. All right, let's watch. He, the New Yorker wrote about Hassan Minhaj and he made a fucking uh, video about The news it. coming see. out of the Middle East right now feels devastating and hopeless. And I've been asked by a lot of people to give my perspective on what is happening in the region. I've also been asked, wait a second, aren't you a liar? Now, for those of you who don't know, back in September, the New Yorker ran a piece on me called Hassan Minhaj's Emotional Truths, in which a reporter fact-checked my stand-up specials and found some factual inaccuracies that they wanted to ask me about. So I sat down with them to explain my writing process and why I make certain creative choices in my stand-up. Now, when the article came out, it got picked up by almost every single news outlet, all of them basically saying the same thing. Critics are raising questions about Hassan Minaj and whether he and other uh, comedians should be more truthful with their material. One of Mr. Minaj's stories is about a white girl he asked to the prom who spurned him on the big day when her parents didn't want pictures taken with a brown boy, except it never happened. Now with everything that's happening in the world, I am aware even talking about this now feels so trivial, but being accused of faking racism is not trivial. It is very serious and it demands an explanation. So to everyone who read that article, I wanna answer the biggest question that's probably on your mind. Is Hassan Minhaj secretly a psycho? Underneath all that pomade, is Hassan Minhaj just a con artist who uses fake racism and Islamophobia to advance his career? Because after reading that article, I would also think that. So I took a beat before responding. Because like you, I've been paralyzed by the news coming out of the Middle East. And I've been processing all the criticism that has come my way. And I just want to say, the fuck? To anyone who felt betrayed or hurt by my stand-up, I am sorry. I made artistic choices to express myself and drive home larger issues affecting me and my community. Bro, and I there ain't no fucking way that I let people down. There ain't no way he made a YouTube apology video being like, yeah, I actually did lie, by the way. That's so weird. Bro, move on. Move on. What are you doing? Move on. Just literally, if he had just been like, Fuck the New Yorker, okay? And and then immediately been like, here is a 21-minute breakdown, comprehensive breakdown on how Israel has slaughtered Palestinian children. People would forget about what the fuck's going on in his life. Oh, my God. Now it looks like he's just being like, hey, I know that uh, things are really fucked up right now. Like, there's ethnic cleansing happening. But also, here, I wanted to make a YouTube apology about how... I I lied in my life and my personal experiences to make comedy specials. What the fuck? He kind of exonerates himself, and really? the reason I feel horrible is because I'm not a psycho. But this New Yorker article definitely makes me look like one. It was so needlessly misleading. Not just about my stand-up, but also me as a person. The truth is, racism, FBI surveillance, and threats to my family happened. And I said this on the record. So I'm going to do the most Hassan Minaj thing ever. I'm going to do a deep dive on my own scandal with graphics. Because there was so much evidence I gave the New Yorker that they ignored that I want to show you. So buckle up because it's about to get tedious. There are three stories from that article that I want to address. The anthrax scare. <laughs> this guy. Dude, dude, dude. Look at how schizo. Look at how schizophrenic my fucking haters are. Are you just saying that because you've been caught in lies too? Divert some attention? Yeah, dude. It must mean that. I love being a three-month subscriber and immediately having the least charitable thing. that, Like having the least charitable perspective on the person that you've like watched. Uh, that you've been following since 2019. You've been following me since 2019. Pretty much like uh, a year in. or More than a year in. But like when I, when I first was uh, thinking about becoming a content creator on this platform full time. You've seen every aspect of my career on this platform and you have waited for the past four years to, and, and throughout that process, not even a single moment did you go, 
man, this guy uh, is is maybe not the piece of shit that I think he is, that other people have told me he is. You know what I mean? Four years, man. You good? You good? Four years? Like, that's how uncharitable you are? Uh, when I said what I said about Hassan Minhaj, it must mean that I have something to hide, too? I wonder why this is his first message in the past three years. I wonder, wonder what led him to come back in here. Last time he wrote something was 2020. Do you even read this stuff, lol? We want Bernie. Obama, we want Bernie. Do you like Destiny then? I love your shit, man. 2019. Love the content, man. Keep it up. Love the content. How do you go from that to this, dude? How? How? Over the course of four years, how do you become this uncharitable? How? How did that happen? Because think about it. Like, I'm over here criticizing an entirely different person for for what he's doing that comes across as very narcissistic. And this guy goes, oh, he's shitting on this other guy, which must mean, like, he's got something to hide himself. Like, how can you fucking turn anything and everything I say back on me in the least charitable way possible? It's crazy. The FBI informant story, but first I want to talk about how and why I was rejected from prom. Now, let me first say this. I am 38 years old with a wife and two kids. I do not give a shit about prom. But it's a big story from my first stand-up special, and the New Yorker implied that I made it all up and that my race wasn't a factor in my rejection. But it was, and I have the evidence to prove it. So, in Homecoming King, I told a story about how I was supposed to go to prom with a white girl named Bethany Reed. Her real name is not Bethany. I changed it to protect her anonymity. I say that I show up at Bethany's house on prom night, but at the doorstep, her mom tells me they don't want her to go to prom with me because they'll be taking a lot of pictures and they don't want their family back home to see her with a brown boy. Bethany's mom did really say that. It was just a few days before prom. And I created the doorstep scene to drop the audience into the feeling of that moment, which I told the reporter. Is the doorstep moment true? Like, no, is, did that happen? No, no, no. It happened before. Like, but the emotional truth remains the same. Her mom going, hey, sweetie, we like, we take photos and we don't want people to see. We have family back home. Did, did she sort of give that as the reason of like, my parents aren't comfortable with yes. going? To, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it was, it just yeah. destroyed me. Yeah. Sure. That's understandable. The reporter said it's understandable. But none of what I explicitly said makes it in the article. This is what... Okay, never mind. I take it back. He kind of cooked them a little bit. That's kind of fucked. <laughs> I, I guess the reporter will say, well, we went back to the, to the lady and she said that that's not something that happened. Okay. What they wrote instead. She told me that she turned down Minhaj, who was then a close friend in person days before the dance. Minhaj acknowledged that this was correct, but he said that the two of them had long carried different understandings of her rejection. This whole paragraph makes it sound like I got friend zoned by Bethany and then I turned into an angry incel and then faked racism to get back at her. And I think this sentence is the reason why people believe that. He said that the two of them had long carried different understandings of her rejection. This sentence is incredibly misleading and implies the exact opposite of what I meant. Let me explain, okay. Over a decade after prom, in August of 2014, Bethany and I met at a restaurant called Sarah Betts in New York, and we cleared the air on what her mom said to me at prom. Now, I talk about this in Homecoming King, and I also told The New Yorker about this meetup. She had an understanding that we were, like, totally cool. Yeah. And, like, I had been carrying something completely different. And I just told her what it meant. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, do you understand what it's like being, a, like, a skinny Muslim Desi Brown kid in Davis, California? And you know, we're always told to put our head down and just take it. And I did. Mm -hmm. And I carried this water mm -hmm. for like years and years. When the article says we had different understandings, what I clearly meant was that Bethany never knew how much her family being racist had affected me. That's why we had different understandings. Not because Bethany denied this happened. In fact, Bethany basically confirmed in writing that racism was a factor in the prom rejection. In 2015, I sent Bethany an email congratulating her on her wedding to a man of color, saying, I know I told you about sharing the story about us not being able to go to prom together with kids and communities to talk about forgiveness and perseverance, but this ending, you guys getting married, is proof that love conquers all. It's a testament to the way the world truly can be. Wishing you guys the absolute best, and here's to a life filled with gorgeous Zayn Malik mixed race babies. Yep, I'm aware. I write emails the way Lin-Manuel Miranda talks. 
I'm not proud of it, but let's stay focused. Bethany then replied saying, I do think love conquers all. And while it might always be challenging, true love is worth the fight. We also had the unique opportunity to showcase both our cultures at the wedding, with a ceremony for each. I think my parents have come a long way too. And what would her parents have to come a long way from? Racism. Again, I don't care about prom. I mean that. And Beth. Okay. What about the anthrax one though? Because like, sure, the <clears throat> people presenting him as an incel is like, I mean, that part was the one that I contested the most and everybody fucking yelled at me when I, this was the, out of the, the, the New York, uh, article, the New York article that I read, like this part that he's defending fairly well is the one part that I contested the most. And people were like, Oh, you don't understand. He's actually an incel. Hassan, this feels illegal for me to know. These emails are beyond cringe. This guy seems so self-centered. He's making my stomach turn. I, I agree, by the way. Bethany didn't do anything wrong. And I wish her and her family nothing but the best. Her parents have grown. My parents have grown. That's the point of the whole show. And that should be celebrated. Love conquers all. But I do not appreciate the New Yorker implying that I made up racism. My team and I repeatedly try to give them the emails that you just saw. As early as, you know, I, I believe fall 2014. I have these a few. Yeah, yeah and then yeah. we have email correspondence in 2017, which we can give you. Okay. Then I now shift to email correspondence, which she can give you. I have it, I can yeah. send Yeah. Yeah. So there's all, and happy to give you all these emails. Sure. Not only that, we confirmed the emails were sent to the reporter and their fact checker before the article came out. Therefore, they knew my rejection was due to race, I confirmed it on the record and provided corroborating evidence. And yet, they misled readers by excluding all of that and splicing two different quotes together to leave you thinking that I made up a racist incident. Now, the article also... I don't think you understand how infuriating it is for someone to accuse one of making up racism. Yeah, you're right, man. I definitely don't understand what it's like when someone says you're making up racism. <laughs> How would I know? What's next? Are you going to be like, you have no idea what it's like when everybody uh, thinks you are a terrorist who loves 9-11 and will regularly keep saying that? What's next? You have no idea what it's like to be clip chimped and then have people fucking yell at you for the thing that you didn't actually say that you didn't even imply, but people said you were implying. You have no idea what it's like to fucking stream on twitch.tv for eight to 10 hours a day talking about politics. You would never know what that's like. Is that what you're going to say next? I, I do know those things, dude. Implies that I should. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Hassan, you don't understand the kind of racism Hassan has gone through. Okay. Humiliated Bethany <laughs> and got her doxxed with my carelessness. So I want to show you evidence that shows that that isn't true. Back in November of 2015, when Homecoming King was running off Broadway, Bethany came to the show, and this is how the New Yorker reported it. You don't know what it's like to be named Hassan with one S. You just don't know Hassan. The woman said that Minhaj had invited her and her husband to an off-Broadway performance. She'd initially interpreted the invitation as an attempt to rekindle an old friendship, but she now believes the move was meant to humiliate her. I promise it was never my intention to humiliate Bethany. You and Hassan Minhaj are genuinely not the exact same. To be fair, you are white passing. Yes, this is a fact that I bring up almost all the goddamn time. But it is pretty funny to say that to someone like myself in general from wherever the fuck the chat is uh, standing. You know what I mean? I know. I, I, the difference between me and Hassan is that, me and Hassan, is that he's, everyone knows he's brown, okay? I am white. That's a big deal. That's a big difference. That gives me a tremendous amount of privilege, okay, at first. But, you know, it's at our, in, uh, at our respective levels of fame, I would say that it's pretty funny to, to say you don't know what it's like because, like, we're both, we both do political commentary and we're both named Hassan. <laughs> you know what I mean? Bethany at the show. But this reporting is false. I looked back at our emails and I found out that I didn't invite Bethany to that show. She emailed me out of the blue and told me that she was coming because her friend saw the show and said they loved it. After the show, Bethany also texted me that it was awesome and we kept in touch for years. I included her in the journey with full transparency 
I put her in touch with fact checkers from This American Life. I invited her to the Netflix premiere party. I even emailed her to take down a tweet that might reveal her identity. Bethany then responded with a really nice email that ended with her saying, P.S. Thanks for the heads up on the tweet. I deleted the other ones, but this one escaped me. It's shockingly hard to resurface old social media, apparently. Thanks, too, for always protecting me and my family. I don't think I've ever formally thanked you for that, and I do sincerely appreciate it. Even oh, in the Netflix special, I don't use any real photos of Bethany or her family. Those are actors, and their faces are blurred. Maintaining Bethany's anonymity has always been a priority for me. Goddamn! Okay, he's kind of cooking, dude. I mean, he spent 10 minutes on this when there's, like, way worse shit in that article, but still... He kind of cooked on this big time. I would never want her to get doxxed or harassed. And if there were any negative consequences that came your way, Bethany, I am sorry about that. I am not. I mean, I think this extends beyond, like, uh, simply uh, fucking silly pitter-patter. You know what I mean? It's not, like, a silly back and forth that, that got misconstrued. Like, this is, like, kind of fucked up. I mean, they... You, you rarely ever... You rarely ever have this level of uh, this level of information on your side when journalists do stuff like this, and journalists do do stuff like this. It's not it's often not even it's. Let me tell you something, okay? Oftentimes, it's not even the individual reporter's fault. Sometimes an editor can do that. Sometimes an editor can decide to change the direction entirely of an interview because they think it's going to be better. Uh, because things have changed in the world or they think it's going to be better because uh, the attitude towards that person has shifted straight up. Uh, here's our official statement. Hassan Minaj confirms in his video that he selectively presents information that embellishes to make a point. Exactly what we reported. Our piece, which includes Minhaj's perspective at length, was carefully reported in fact check. It is based on interviews with more than 20 people, including former Patriot Act and Daily Show staffers. Members of Minhaj's security team and people who have been subject to his stand-up work, including your former FBI informant brother Eric and the woman at the center of the prom rejection story. We stand by our story. Yeah, that's kind of fucked up. How can you stand by her story? You wrote the entire thing knowing he actually told you the truth beyond why he was changing parts uh, of the stories to protect people in real life, for example, and he provided receipts. Are you going to do Chappelle's 3 a.m. baby routine next? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. They kind of clip chimped him pretty fucking hard, uh, especially on this one. Weird that this hit piece on a Muslim brown leftist-ish man came out right after he was getting considered to permanently host The Daily Show. Yeah, I wonder if they, like, cooked his ass uh, completely. I wonder if they, like, destroyed any chances he might have had of, of hosting The Daily Perfect, Show. but I promise I am not needlessly cruel, even though that's what The New Yorker wants you to Chat it up, though. Listen, I stand on my, I stand on my fucking two legs and say, I told you so, motherfuckers. Okay, there were parts of that story that were unimaginable and unhinged. Okay, and I still maintain that position, like the anthrax story and shit. But there were parts of that story where I said, "This doesn't seem to be the way that the New Yorker is presenting it." And I fucking told you, I told you, motherfuckers, because you didn't want to believe a brown man. Okay, you did not want to believe a Muslim man could ever experience racism. Okay, a lot of you Karens fucking jumped out. And we're like, nope, this is actually a, a, and I said it at the time, this is actually a, 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 con a two different perspectives here at play. You have white ladies who are, who have been victimized by incels looking at the story and thinking this guy's a fucking weird, gross incel. What the hell? Uh, and, and then blaming racism. And then you have brown boys who fucking looked at the situation. And we're like, what do you mean? This happened to me. What the fuck are you talking about? It's not that crazy that these guys are just like ripping him apart. You will never be a brown boy, never be a big boy, never be Japanese. I'm not a brown boy, okay? I'm not. I'm not. Hassan equals Hamas. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks, Shawnee boy. You to believe, despite the evidence. Fucking got him. I was an open book. I sat down in good faith. They had my testimony and four years of correspondence backed up with receipts all on the record that showed... My race was a factor in my prom rejection. I wasn't careless with Bethany's privacy. And she thanked me for keeping her family's identity safe. So how could the New Yorker imply the opposite? But here's the bigger question. Why did the New Yorker fact check my stand-up special, but not properly fact check their own article? If you're still here, I have two more stories that I want to address. Now in my second special, The King's Jester, I tell a story I think the problem is that the less believable parts of the story made people think everything was fake. Yeah, maybe. Story about how I met and was harassed by an FBI informant named Brother. 
Yeah, I like that. Exactly. Duality of chat. You're too white for racism to happen to you, but also you're Muslim, so you like Hamas. Yeah. I mean, let's keep it a buck 50 here, okay? I, I am very white. I, I do recognize that, okay? Most people don't immediately go, oh, that guy must be Muslim, right? Until they hear my name, and then they're like, okay, maybe that guy is Muslim. But ultimately, at this stage in my career, and at his stage in his career, and even when he was a fucking kid, everybody knew, for both of us, what our backgrounds are. That's why I was saying, like, I, I, I do understand what it's like sometimes. Brother Eric. I talk about how he tried to entrap me at a gym, and when I made fun of him, he slammed me against the hood of a cop car. The truth is, I did have altercations with undercover law enforcement growing up, and that experience formed the basis of this story. But it didn't go down exactly like this. So I understand why people are upset. People face real danger at the hands of the police, and false stories can undermine real stories. And I am sorry I added to that problem. My intention wasn't to take away from these stories. It was to spotlight them through my special. That's why I used this story to talk about Hamid Hayat. Hamid and I were part of the same NorCal Muslim community. When he got entrapped, it rocked our community, and he spent 14 years in prison. We were the same age, same background, and like him, I also had run-ins with undercover agents. I was even physically harassed by them while playing basketball. Now you're probably wondering, why not just say that? So this is not an excuse. It is an explanation of my process. When I am storytelling, every beat has to do multiple things in a funny and impactful way. With the story, I had to set up three plot points. The moment I realized authority figures hate being made fun of, why I named my show Patriot Act and spotlight the story of Hamid Hayat. The problem is 99% of people watching Netflix have no idea the FBI spied on Muslims at mosques or they don't even believe it was real. And I know this because when I performed earlier versions of the story in front of audiences, they had no idea what I was talking about. FBI agents embedding in mosques and entrapping young Muslims through basketball or weightlifting or whatever. It sounds insane. But it was happening all over the country, even in my mosque, in my hometown. It was infiltrated. And the footage that I used in the special proves that it was very real and very stupid. I wanted to recreate. Will Hassan address how he stole your career? Yeah, what the fuck, dude? Address that part, you piece of shit. That feeling <laughs> that only Muslims felt for a broad audience. The feeling of paranoia and vindication, tension, and release. That is why people laugh at this part. You don't get the release without the tension. That was my artistic intent, which I told the New Yorker. If you notice something about, even in the show, we pop out of it, and this is actually the point I was trying to make. Uh, my dad goes, that's not Brother Eric. His, na his, na his name is not Eric. His name is Craig. And the, 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 the moment that the, the reaction the audience is having is, nudge me, you're missing the point. The point is, is that it's, it doesn't matter if his name was Eric, Craig, or Adam. The point is, is that there is now a pattern here at large. Sure. And that, that was the thing that I was trying to do. And ultimately, the emotional truth of trying to point a spotlight on my community story and, and Hamid's story is important to me. Hamid Hayat's story is really important to me. And he reached out to me after the article came out. And he wanted me to share these texts. He said that he had nothing but love for me and that I hadn't diminished his story. That's what I was trying to do. But the reporter was far more concerned about the FBI informant I talked about in the special, which honestly felt very weird. In oh, there's another part. Yeah, this FBI informant, if I remember correctly, and I talked about this as well, is like a pedophile, isn't he? Um, I think I talked about this while, while covering the story, uh, w writing the New Yorker thing too. Cause like, we'll see, we'll see. It might be a different FBI informant, but FBI uh, 100, I think this was the guy. The story oh, about that's... the informant, actually the bulk of the story is about Craig Monty. Like sure. you, and so did sure. you reach out to Craig Monty? No. Do you feel like you owe him anything? I've heard some things and I'd rather not speak on that. So you feel like you don't owe him, you didn't owe him like a heads up? As a Muslim. Am I supposed to apologize? Yeah, that part is fucking nuts. Like, I mean, dude, I, I can't believe he's fucking writing this entire video, but like, this was kind of my, this was kind of my fucking take too. It's like, what do you mean? Like, owe an apology for what? Apologize to an ex-con who tried to entrap Muslims for the FBI. Yeah, maybe if he gave us a heads up, I would owe him a heads up. 
Now, the last story I want to talk about is the anthrax care. My last special, I talk about how I received a letter in the mail. This part is the, the fucking crazy one. Um, I don't know if it was Craig Montiel that, Montiel that was the pedophile. Craig Montiel say he did not balk when his FBI handlers gave him the okay to have sex with Muslim women in his undercover operation was targeting. Nor at the time did he shy away from recording their pillow talk. But it's like wild to be like, I can't believe you're fucking slandering this undercover FBI informant who was like, notice how he left the anthrax one for last in the video, meaning this one's probably a lie. Yeah, that one for me, I think for me, that was the worst thing that he did. Like that was is, is indefensible. Like it's giving this story was giving like Amy Schumer thinks Hamas is going to come and kill her in her fucking gated neighborhood in like Bel Air. You know what I mean? That's what it was giving a little bit. And when I opened the letter, white powder fell on my daughter. And we had to take her to the hospital only to find out it was not real anthrax. This, as you know, is not how it went down. And let me just say, I am sorry for embellishing the story or if anyone was worrying about me and my family. I apologize. But let me make something clear. A letter with white powder was sent to my apartment in February of 2019. I opened it in the kitchen. Powder fell on the table and my daughter was just a few feet away. After 10 seconds of freaking out, I realized it was not anthrax and that someone was fucking with me because people had been fucking with me since January 1st, 2019 after this happened. Netflix under fire today after its decision to pull an episode of a comedy show that was critical of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The truth is, when this news broke, my life got very scary. Saudi bots were spamming my socials. A threatening letter was sent to Netflix. I was getting weird phone calls at night. Then fake anthrax was sent to my house. And after that happened, I asked Netflix for our security guard to follow me everywhere. And people noticed. Friends were texting me about seeing me rolling everywhere through New York with security. And at one point, my wife even asked our security detail if he knew any companies that sold those tiny GPS trackers for strollers because we were concerned that someone might try to kidnap or hurt our daughter. That is all real. The danger at that time was palpable, but Bina and I decided to keep the anthrax scare private because we were worried that Netflix might shut down my show which would have put my entire staff out of work. Now you might be wondering, this is all terrifying, so why embellish? Why even say you took your daughter to the hospital? The night of the anthrax care, Bina and I, we got into a huge argument and she kept asking, Hassan, what if this powder fell on our daughter? So I created do you, similar, do you have similar experiences with safety as a brown man? I'm not a brown man. Don't fucking say dumb shit like this. I've never said I'm a brown man, okay? Suck my dick. Um, the only reason why I experience uh, issues with my fucking safety is, is not because I'm uh, Muslim or anything. It's because I'm... Uh, it's because I, I have a lot of Nazi haters. We did the hospital scene to put the audience in that same shock and fear that me and Bina felt playing out that night yeah i still think it's fucking nuts i i think this is like a crazy thing to to add i i told you guys like of course comedians embellish of course like their their job is to tell a story and centering themselves in the middle of the story is not as uh as big as an issue obviously like that's the goal the major reason why a lot of people are yelling at him is because like he is the type of person um he's the type of person to to also do like a ted talk basically you know what I mean? What is this? People of Gaza, like the Israeli says, senior Hamas leader killed 250 targets attacked in Gaza raid. Wait, there's a raid? What the fuck? <laughs> a raid happened? What the fuck? Anyway, um, I think that I, I think that there are issues with with Hassan Minhaj. Uh, there are issues with every fucking person, uh, you know. But uh, I think that this part was a little bit different. Like the the anthrax thing is like a little fucking wild. So, um, this is why you watch Al Jazeera. Yeah, okay. Uh, where was I? Let me finish this and we'll get back to that, okay? Bolo on Saturday. Yes. If we held Hassan Minhaj to based on a true story standards, none of this would be controversial. Uh, it might be a blind spot for me. Why is the anthrax story made up, like, bad to make up? Dude, it's like... That part is, like, pretty fucking wild, in my opinion. Like, to say that... I guess it's like... I guess, like... Uh, he wasn't, he, he didn't like, the only part that he made up was that he went to the hospital. 
that he didn't actually get. Uh, I mean, he he got fake anthrax sent to him, and uh, and that the only part he lied about was that he took his daughter to the hospital, which I still think is like kind of a wild thing. Then I added uh, to to add on to the story the investigator character because women in my life were telling me that Bina was coming off super naggy in old versions of the story. So I gave some of Bina's lines to other characters so that her perspective was represented in a way that didn't reflect poorly on her. Again, I am sorry if I crossed a line here, but I told the story this way to put the audience on the roller coaster ride that we were both experiencing at that time. Now look, I understand why people were upset by all of this. Different comedians have different expectations built into their personas. I th like that part is the most uh, powerful aspect of it is that like when he when he's telling that story, it's like Anthrax fell on his fucking daughter in that moment. He thinks it's real. You know what I mean? That's like like that's, uh, you know, that's this very emotional thing. But like I said, let me tell you something. OK, let me tell you something. The reason why this is a big problem is because he's not a ha ha fart guy. OK, he's a hmm, serious uh, look at me. I'm going to tell you about racism and other stuff, guy. That's it. Uh, there's a distinction in comedy, and I feel like that's the major reason as to why uh, people take this super seriously, because, like, his fan base takes it super seriously as well, like the things that he says. I don't as much. I like I, I like him. I value his, his, his space. You know what I mean? Um, I think he does a good job. Uh, there are obviously, like, uh, I don't think he goes as hard. Um, and I think that, like, the Antarctic story, I guess, like, that's the most uh, ridiculous one, as I said. Uh, when we were looking at it, and I think that that was um, that's the one that he didn't do a good enough job defending, in my opinion, here as well. Have you been silly today? I've been silly. I'm silly every day. I serve the top of the hour ad break every day, and I do a segue on it. You know what I mean? But yeah, if this were John Mulaney, nobody would give a shit, I guess. Um, but uh, the other two are pretty fucking damaging, in my opinion. Like the way that uh, the way that they they cooked him on that, especially the first one, which he had the most evidence for. You know. Um, for you though, you will have no evidence at the top of the hour ad break as long as you subscribe for five dollars or for free at the top of the hour, or uh, get gifted a sub if you're lucky. Here's a three-minute ad break now. Let me tell you something. I could have used this as an opportunity to fucking just dagger this man and be like, "This man, he fucking lived my dream. He was on the Daily Show. His name is Hassan. He does political satire. I grew up wanting to wanting to do basically what he was doing, and and there's no." There's no place for two Hassans, okay? You can have two Johns, right? You can have a Stephen Colbert and a John Stewart, but you can't have fucking two Hassans doing political satire, political comedy, or, or political commentary in general in America, okay? And now we got three. We got Mehdi Hassan, too. So I could have just fucking, yeah, you brought up a pussy guillotine and asked if you've been silly today. Exactly. I could have fucking brought up the guillotine on him, but I didn't because I wanted to be honest, and I think that he is... Um, you know, he's, he's an all right dude, you know, he's just, I think people take him too seriously. Maybe he takes himself too seriously. As a matter of fact, I had two different expectations built into my work, <laughs> my work as a storytelling comedian. See, he's still doing it. Like he, he could have just, he could just be like, dude, I'm a comedian. Okay. People yell at me all the fucking time. And, and I say, I'm a dumb himbo. I'm a fucking Twitch streamer. Everybody calm down. But it's true. At the end of the day, I do talk about pussy guillotines. You know what I mean? I talk about dumb shit all the fucking time. I burp into the microphone, unlike Sean Hannity. And I think that that's important to understand. I, like, I don't place myself at this, like, high level as a, as a fucking community leader or an activist or something. I just, I'm just a normal guy. Okay? I'm just a normal dude. He wants people to take him seriously sometimes and not seriously sometimes is the problem. He really can't have it both ways. People are too dumb. I mean, I guess, like, I don't want to be taken seriously, uh, but I do get taken seriously. You know what I mean? Why do you keep burping in the mic, though? Your audio is impeccable except for the burps. I just, like, I don't know. I like doing it. And my work <sighs> as a political comedian, where facts always come first. That is why the fact-checking on Patriot Act was extremely rigorous. The fact-checking in my congressional testimony, deeply rigorous. I don't think there's any... Chad, I have no other place to put this, but as a breather, mental break, I'm going to serve it with a mutual friend, and there's this dude in there who interacted once with Hassan IRL and is a deranged hater for some reason, and all of us are roasting this guy for being a fucking dork like that. 
Wait, he interacted with me? Where did he interact with me? I've never interacted with a fucking deranged hater uh, in in real life. He probably came up like a pussy. Like, he probably came up as, like, a fan. Most of these guys, like, most of these guys fucking come in. Yeah, also, you added me. Of course I'm going to read it. Most of these dudes come up and, and act like they're going to be fucking insane. Maybe the guy you yelled at at TwitchCon. No, that's not that guy. No shot. It's from last year. There's no way. He responded. What did he say? What did he say? What's his at? I lost it. One streamer from an LV house party years ago. Hasanabi goes to a house party in Vegas. What? This guy is the guy who hates me. I don't even. Damn. I don't even remember this at all. I thought we were having like friendly banter. Why is this guy carried that with him for the rest of his life? Damn, dude. I, I never, I did not think about this guy at all ever again for the rest of my life. And this man has like carried this much hate in his heart for fucking years. That's sad, brother. God damn. Damn, had a rent free apartment in this dude's head for two whole ass years. Bro, that's sad. That's so sad. That's not healthy. I, I, I really, listen, listen. I really feel bad. I do. Okay. But I promise you, dude, uh, you go back and tell your homie in the fucking, he probably thinks you hate him. Lost same issue you brought up during sad boys. I don't think about him at all. I don't even know who this guy is. I don't even remember if I, if he came up to me right now, I would never be able to, to tell you who he is. I have no idea what his face looks like. This is guys. This is from literally June 16th, 2021, where I went to a fucking, Random ass like house party in Las Vegas. I feel bad. I do feel bad. This man is debating at a house party. I love this clip. I think I think it's not good to to carry that much anger, resentment, frustration. This is from like 2019. Yeah, it's like it's even older than 2021 if I'm not mistaken. This was, yeah, this was in, oh my God, it's even worse. Oh my God, this was when we were in Las Vegas during Bernie. This was the fucking, this was like February 2020, dog. Oh my God. Oh, that's so bad. It's literally pre-COVID. Like a whole ass COVID occurred. A whole ass COVID occurred in between this moment and where we're at now. And you're telling me that this dude still carries resentment? Fuck. Wow. <laughs> I wonder how many people I've like done this to that just like have made it their entire lives mission. I suspect it's like there's got to be a bunch that have like banned and have said like I've banned and said really horrible things to at times when I was in my weakest moments, you know what I mean? And then they just like carry that for the rest of their lives. They like move into a, into a community that is like more hospitable. Fuck. You watch you blow up. It made it worse. Yeah. That's kind of, I'm telling you resentment is important for me as well. Okay. As someone who is very spite-driven personally, okay? Let me tell you something. There's got to be a point where you let it go. It's better for your own health. Like, I, spite that I have for my enemies are enemies that I haven't made up in my mind. They're enemies that are in my life, that have harmed me in my life. There's a difference between that and just like me hating someone viscerally, someone that I might not even have like a real fucking political disagreement with. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, there's a difference. This is why I don't understand so many people who are like liberals who are just like, no, Hassan is worse than Ben Shapiro. You know what I mean? People who say like, no, I'm, I'm infatuated with my hatred of you. I think you are worse because I think you're like a tanky secretly. That you're secretly tanky. Uh, and you're just like more damaging to American politics than like Nick Fuentes or Ben Shapiro or, or any number of like genuine out and about Nazis where they're just like, like, what do you think is going on? You think we, you think there's a Vanguard Marxist Leninist party that is like, that I'm cultivating here? Like what's happening?
desperately trying to fucking tie me to stochastic terrorism, not recognizing that the only way that that works is if you are pushing in the direction of the pre-existing oppressive hierarchies and not vice versa. Makes me kind of sad. A Twitter thread the other day was confidently comparing you to Alex Jones. Yeah, that's what I mean. I, I just, I feel like, I feel like if when you get to that level, I, I don't think anyone is around you to check you to be like, what are you talking about? But when you get to that level, it's just like kind of is over. It's Jover uh, where Azan, people who hate, see you as the guy who in charge of the American left unironically and have told me you have more power than some senators. <laughs> yeah, dude. I do. I, I have more power than senators. I hear a lot from your haters. I hear a lot from... They think you're worthy of hating criticism as the world's biggest political commentator, but like you say, you're just some guy. First of all, I'm not the world's biggest political commentator. Maybe by size, like actual physical stature, but nothing else. That's ridiculous. Like Ben Shapiro, Steven Crowder, and the like exist. Tucker Carlson exists. So if you are if you are talking to someone who lives in this universe with you, a universe in which Tucker Carlson, Ben Shapiro, Fox News in its entirety, which is the most popular news network, exists, and CNN and MSNBC, and they are still like, no, Hassan is the biggest political commentator. We have to criticize him. Then you're talking to an unserious person. You're not talking to a serious person. You're talking to an unserious person. You're talking to a person who has horse blinders on, and they unfortunately only see the world uh, uh, from from a very narrow framework. There's two different things that uh, there's two different conflicting factors here. One is uh, whether or not I'm like actually the biggest political commentator. I'm not. That one is is demonstrably false. I wish that's not the case. And the other factor here is like my impact. People that think my impact is actually bad, that I'm actually like regularly, um, I guess, I don't know, brainwashing people into not believing that America is good. You have said that you're the biggest on Twitch. That's a little bit different, I think, than me saying I'm the biggest political commentator, don't you think? The daily active usership of Twitch is marginal in comparison to like other video platforms. I hope you understand that. Yes, I'm the biggest political commentator on Twitch. That doesn't mean I'm the biggest political commentator. You, we're talking about a video game platform. What are you, what are we what are we talking about? You think that yeah. Anyway, the point is this. You're the biggest one they can interact with and reach because of the nature of live streaming. My point is this. My point is this. Um I think that I've heard libs go after you for pushing people to the right by being divisive. Yeah, there is like, you'll notice something. I think a lot of people will come up with different reasons as to why I'm bad. And ultimately, the major difference is that they just don't agree with me. And oftentimes they're more conservative than I am. But they still want to maintain the aesthetic of being someone who's not a liberal and like more radical than liberal. So they look at like actual radical politics and are scared of it and hate that like it has to be like someone like myself and my existence makes them look bad in the eyes of normies because then it's like uh, they can't just say that they're just a regular liberal so they have to turn around and say i'm like an ultra like or well they don't say that they don't know what that term is but they say i'm a tanky right and i think like part of the reason is because they're very it's just very um very aesthetics focused i'm gonna move on from this point in a second but one thing that I have talked about quite a bit back in the day, and maybe it bears repeating now, is that like because I've always wanted to build a large coalition, I don't really care about people that are to my further left, right? And I oftentimes will let a lot of things go even if I don't fully agree with someone. Why do I do this? Well, I'll tell you why. Because those who are further down the line in their radical politics to myself, they'll end up pushing the the needle in the direction that I think it must go. But that also is the reason why there are plenty of social Democrats who I ultimately won't agree with uh, that I, I think are, are valid in their criticisms of, of uh, the 
American project that has been a failure so far. Because from where we are standing, if you look at the material conditions, if you look at what American existence looks like, social democrats or people who only preach social democracy are still entirely, entirely considered radical. Look at, ben, look at Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders has never pushed for any policy that is beyond social democracy, okay? So I think ultimately my goal is to change people's minds. Anarchists are based as fuck. Go read some Malatesta. I've never read Malatesta, but I have read Kropotkin. I don't know why you are saying go read Kropotkin, my dude. I have. Anyway, I feel like you do the same thing with anarchists sometimes. Not all of us are extremely crusty. I agree. I mean, I'm, I'm making jokes, but I make jokes about fucking Marxist Leninists too. I make jokes about every aspect of the left, and I make jokes about social democrats as well. Now, my point is this, okay? How can you say it's a failure? Maybe in the most literal sense of the word, but America is the longest standing democracy in the history of the world. It has proven a lot of things. Yeah, like might is right politics. How can I say it's a failure? There's no other country that has been uh, uh, less disrupted in its historical process due to how far away it is from every other fucking actual point of conflict and has yet uh, provided decent results for the average citizen. What the fuck are we talking about? There are literally third world developing nations out there that use their marginal GDP to, to offer better amenities for their individual citizens. Meanwhile, you can't even fucking pay for insulin here. What the fuck are we talking about? There is no bigger failure than the United States, okay? It's a massive success if you are literally a Raytheon executive. It's a massive success if you're a capital owner. But it is demonstrably a failure for the average citizen. We have the most money. We are the wealthiest nation on the planet. We are the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. And yet we still have people that are dying of a lack of adequate food. We have child starvation in this country. We have food insecurity in this country for children. Children still have fucking uh, lunch debt in this country. What are we talking about? That is before we even get into healthcare and medicine. We pay 10 times the price for medicine than any other country in comparison to any other fucking country. We have the worst overarching healthcare outcomes in comparison to other OECD nations. It's completely unacceptable. We have a fucking mass shooting happening almost every goddamn day. That's why I say it's literally a failure because it has been failing ever since the regulatory bodies have been captured. How can you say it's a failure? Maybe in the most literal sense of the word? Yeah, that's what do you mean? You think I mean it in a spiritual sense? I mean it in a literal sense. It is a failure. A dude walked in to a bowling alley yesterday in Maine and shot 18 people and killed them walked into a different fucking restaurant and killed people there too. And he's still on the lamp. This dude had serious mental health issues and he had been fucking, he had been stopped before. I know this guy agrees with me. I don't know why he just said it in a very contentious way. Yeah. National total of $262 million in student lunch debt annually. And we are going to keep shaming kids and we're going to send $1 trillion to wars. It's like, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. America is literally... For for all of its uh for all of its advantages, America is literally the biggest failure, the most abject failure. Anyway, huh? So, yeah, it's it's a it's a massive failure. My point was my point was there's a lot of people that get mad at me when I say America bad, but they don't hear why I say America bad. They love it when I say America bad because no health care, right? But they don't like it when I say America bad. And maybe some other countries do good things that America should do when it's outside of the Western sphere of influence. Because I make comparisons to Norway all the fucking time and people go, you know what? That's right. But if I make comparisons to China, then God fucking forbid, dude. Are you kidding me? High speed rail? You better fucking shut your goddamn mouth, you communist piece of shit. You fucking, you want seven gorillion Uyghur Muslims to be genocided, Okay. You want every fucking Muslim to be genocided like it did, like they did in Xinjiang. That's what you want to do. I know this. Also, simultaneously, I love when Israel is doing genocide to the Palestinians. That's what I love. But oh my God, oh, but, dude, China, they're the ones who did it the most and the maximum amount and, and, and in an unacceptable way because they did it outside of the sphere of American influence. But, but Israel, when they do it, it's, oh, okay. Okay, let's not call it a genocide now, okay? Let's not call it a fucking genocide. You, you're crazy. 
Yeah.